Hello everyone, in this video I'm going to talk about diffusion, osmosis, and selective permeability. I'm going to talk about three different lab experiments in this video, and what you need to keep in mind is that we are not going to have time this week to go over every experiment, but you do need to understand the concept in each experiment, and um, know that you will be asked on it in your final lab exam. So let's begin with the first one. Um, let's first keep in mind what diffusion is. Diffusion is the movement of molecules, ions, or particles from areas of high concentration to low concentration. This is how things naturally move in nature. They move from areas of high concentration to low concentration, or in other words, they move from order to disorder. For example, if you have a beaker here filled with water and you put a few drops of dye in there, even if you put it in one specific spot, you're going to notice that these dye molecules are going to diffuse to other areas where there is no dye molecules and they're going to spread out. This is an example of diffusion. This is a form of passive transport because this doesn't require any energy. It is just the natural movement of molecules. Osmosis is a type of diffusion. It is specifically the movement of water molecules. And just like other molecules, um, water molecules will move from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. Now here's the first experiment. We want to investigate the effect of size and temperature on the rate of diffusion. What you need to keep in mind is that as you increase size or mass, molecular weight, the rate of diffusion will slow down. As you increase temperature, the rate of diffusion will increase. So in this experiment, you have two different dyes here, Janus green and potassium permanganate. What you're gonna notice is that their molecular weight is different. Janus green is 511 Daltons, and potassium permanganate is 294 Daltons. Janus green obviously has a higher molecular mass, therefore we can hypothesize that it will diffuse slower than potassium permanganate. What you would do in this experiment is to take an agar plate and pierce two holes in the gel and you're going to um, pour a few drops of each dye into the, um, into the holes. So here you would pour potassium permanganate and then Janus green. And if you let this sit, if you let this um, agar plate sit for a while, you'll notice that the dye will start to diffuse through the gel. Now, potassium permanganate here, as you can see, has diffused further than Janus green. That is because potassium permanganate has a lower molecular mass, therefore it is going to diffuse faster. If you look here, um, here's another example of three, three different dyes, um, safranin, methylene blue, and potassium permanganate. I don't know if these are in Daltons or not, but um, as long as they are all in the same unit, we could still compare them to one another. As you could see here, safranin is going to be the dye with the highest molecular weight. And potassium permanganate is the one with the lowest molecular weight. So if you look over here, what you'll see is that potassium permanganate has diffused the fastest and safranin has been diffusing the slowest, and this has to do all with their molecular weights. So the higher the molecular mass, the slower the rate of diffusion. Another factor that has an effect on the rate of diffusion is temperature. I was not able to find a picture of agar plates um, in different temperatures, but the concept you could see here in this picture. Here you have um, two beakers with the same amount of water. One is hot water, the other one is cold water. Now they use two different dyes, but if you use the same dye, what you'll notice is that the one 
that is poured into the hot water is going to diffuse at a much faster rate than, rate than the one with cold water. Same thing, if you had um, two Petri dishes like this, identical ones, and you put one in zero degrees Celsius and one in 37 degrees Celsius, you'll notice that the one with the 37 de degrees Celsius has had the highest rate of diffusion for all the dyes. So that is the basic concept to keep in mind, higher temperature, higher rate of diffusion. Now, I'm going to talk about the effect of um, solute concentration on osmosis. Um, this can be a little bit complicated, but um, we're going to break it down as much as we can. So first, let's talk about what a dialysis tube is. What you see in this beaker, this tube here, is a dialysis tube. A dialysis bag or tube, as you can see here, um, is kind of unique. It has little holes on it. So it is not perfectly impermeable. It allows certain molecules and ions to pass through. When you first buy it, it kind of looks like it's one layer over here, but this is actually two layers that are attached to one another like this. What you're going to do is um, cut off a piece of it and leave, leave it in warm water. When you soak it in water for a little bit, the two layers are going to, to basically detach from each other, and then you're going to have a tube like this. And the way that you work with it is that you're going to take a piece of string and tie off one end, and then you can pour the content that you want into this tube and tie the other end. I made a mistake here, by the way. Um, this is incorrect because glucose can actually pass through. So um, the small pores, there's going to be little pores here. When you, If you actually put it under the microscope, you can see little holes on it. And what's really important to keep in mind is that water molecules can pass through these pores, but large molecules, some large macromolecules, such as protein and starch, cannot pass through these uh, pores on the dialysis tube. Okay, so let's take a look at this. So you're going to have a beaker and a dialysis bag. You're gonna pour 200 milliliters of distilled water into the beaker. First thing you should do is write these down. So distilled water, which means that this is going to be 100% water. I'm gonna write it here in the beaker. And then you're gonna add 10 milliliters of 10% sucrose into bag one. In this bag, you're going to have the solution that is going to be 10% sucrose. Which means what? 90% of it is going to be water. And when you have problems like this on your exam, I need you to write it down and just kind of take a look at it, kind of make a chart like this for yourself, a little diagram like this for yourself, and it will make more sense. And we want to see what will happen to the mass of this bag once we leave it in this water for a while. And you're supposed to put this dialysis tube here. So you're going to have a tube. You're going to fill it with um, the solution that has 10% sucrose and 90% water, and you're going to leave it in a beaker that is filled with 100% water. And you're going to leave it there for 40 minutes. Now, keep in mind, again, this is a dialysis bag, which means that there's little holes on it. Here's something to keep in mind. Sucrose molecules cannot pass through the, the dialysis bag.
but as you remember, water molecules can't. So nothing's going to happen to the sucrose here. It's not going to leave the bag. But water molecules can diffuse through. And let's take a look at this. This is 100% water. This is a 90% water. And we know that things in nature move from what? High concentration to low concentration. 100%, 90%. So the way that the water is going to move, it's going to move from high concentration to low concentration. So it is going to diffuse into the bag. So what's going to happen here is that this bag is going to gain mass. What you would do if you're actually doing this in lab is that you're going to take this bag here, um, pour the content into it, weigh it, put it into this beaker, let it sit for 40 minutes and weigh it again. And it actually very obviously gains mass. So we say actually that this bag was placed in a hypotonic solution. Hypotonic solution is when the solution here on the outside has less solutes than what's inside the bag. And remember, the solute here is sucrose. Now let's um, go to the next one. So here you're going to pour 200 milliliters of 10% sucrose into the beaker. So we're going to go ahead and write this down again. So 10% sucrose in the beaker, which means what? 90% water. And then here we have this dialysis bag, and we're gonna pour 10 milliliters of distilled water into bag, in this bag over here. This isn't supposed to be bag one, by the way, it's bag two. Um, and this is going to be 100% water. Again, sucrose cannot diffuse through this dialysis membrane. It's going to stay where it is. It's too big to pass through those holes. But water can. And we know that water moves from high area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So 100%, 90%, which means that it will go this way. So water will diffuse out of the bag. Therefore, this bag here is going to lose mass. So if you weigh it before, weigh it after, after it's going to uh, be significantly less. Um, and we also say that this bag is placed in a hypertonic solution. And hypertonic is when the solute concentration outside of the bag is higher than inside of the bag. Now let's go to bag three. Again, I forgot to make some adjustments here. This is not bag one, it is bag three. Um, so you have 200 milliliters of 10% sucrose. So let's write it here, 10% sucrose in the beaker, which means 90% will be water. And then inside the bag, you're also going to pour 10% sucrose. Which means 90% will be water. 
So now what you could see is that the concentration of water inside the bag and outside the bag is the same. So there's going to be the same amount coming in, same amount going out. It doesn't mean that there's no movement. There's still movement of um, water molecules in and out of the bag, through the bag, but it's the same. So in this case, the bag will weigh the same. So no change in mass of the bag. And we say here that this bag was placed in an isotonic solution, which means that the solute concentration inside the bag and outside the bag is the same. Therefore, there's not going to be any losing or gaining of mass. The movement is going to be the same going in and um, leaving the bag. Now let's talk about selective permeability of membranes. Um, the dialysis bag, it's oftentimes used for these experiments because it resembles the cell membrane in many ways, because it is semi-permeable, meaning that it allows certain things to pass through, but not everything. And that's sort of how your cell membranes are. They allow certain things in and out, but not everything. And of course, the way that your cell membranes work is much more complicated than the dialysis bag, but the dialysis bag is a good model to use for experiments sometimes. So in this experiment, you're going to have a beaker here filled with water, that's it. And then you're going to have a solution inside this bag that contains um, chloride ions. So let's go ahead and write that down. So inside this chloride ions, and then here you're just going to have water. And you're going to let this bag sit here for 40 minutes. And what we want to investigate is that are these chloride ions going to move out of the bag or not? So you let this bag sit in this water for 40 minutes. And what you're going to do is take two milliliters after 40 minutes, two milliliters of this solution in the beaker, put it in a test tube and test it for chloride ions. And here's what you need to remember. Silver nitrate is used to test for the presence of chloride ions. So if the test results are positive, you're going to see a white precipitate um, forming in the test tube. So here you're going to have the solution from the beaker. If it's negative, nothing's going to happen. If it's positive, meaning that there's sodium chloride or there's chloride ions in there, it's going to look something like this. Based on um, what I looked up, the test results should be positive for this. So chloride ions will be able to diffuse through the membrane and the test results should be positive. What you do need to keep in mind for your exam is that silver nitrate is used to test for the presence of chloride ions. And you should know what a positive test and what a negative test for chloride ions looks like. Next, we're going to do pretty much the same thing, except in this bag here, we're going to have sulfate ions this time. And we're going to leave it in this beaker filled with water. Um, it's just water, nothing else. And we're going to let it sit for 40 minutes. And if um, the sulfate ions diffuse out of it, we're going to get a positive test result for it. So for sulfate ions, we use barium chloride. And again, this milky white um, coloration uh, precipitate will form inside the beaker, um, excuse me, inside the test tube if the sulfate ions have diffused. So you're going to let this sit there for 40 minutes and then take a sample of this water, put it in a test tube, add barium chloride to it and see what happens. 
And this is sort of what a positive test will look like, if it is positive. However, this test, um, from my understanding, comes out negative. So sulfate ions cannot pass through the membrane. Again, what we want to keep in mind is that barium chloride is used to test for sulfate ions, and we also want to know what a positive and a negative test for sulfate ions looks like. Next, you're going to do the same thing, but this time you're going to add um, the solution inside this bag that has reducing sugars, such as glucose. So inside here, we're going to have glucose, and then here you're going to have 100% water. And again, you're going to put this bag inside the water, let it sit for 40 minutes, and after 40 minutes, you're going to take a sample of this water that was inside the beaker to see if glucose has diffused out or not. And what you're going to use is um, Benedict's reagent to test for reducing sugars. Once you add Benedict's reagent to your test tube, um, you need to let it boil for about three minutes in 100 degrees Celsius for this test to work. And this is what it will look like. If it is positive, it's going to turn into this dark brown color over here. If it is negative, it's just going to remain blue. Benedict's solution is blue, so it just diffuses through the water and nothing will happen to it. What's going to happen here is that these glucose molecules are, are going to be able to diffuse through. So this test will come out positive. Okay, for test tube four, you're gonna have um, here, you're gonna have inside the bag, a solution containing starch. This is just 100% water. And you're gonna put this bag inside this water, let it sit for 40 minutes, take a sample of this water, put it in a test tube and test for the presence of starch to see if it has diffused out. Iodine, is used to test for the presence of starch. Um, and this is incorrect right here. I need to take it off. A dark blue-black color indicates positive test results. And by the way, I will make these um, changes to the PowerPoint um, before posting it on Brightspace. What you'll find is that starch actually cannot diffuse out of this bag. And that is because starch is a very large molecule and it cannot diffuse out of these small, tiny pores. So the test results will be negative because starch is too large, but I want you to know what a positive test result looks like. This is a positive test result for starch. This is a negative test result. And this is just like the yellow, it's just the color of iodine. Iodine has this yellow golden color. And if the test results are negative, it's just the color of the iodine, nothing else. So again, iodine is used to test for the presence of starch. And this is what the positive test looks like. This is what negative test results look like. Now, the last tube um, is going to contain protein inside this. And then 100% water here. And the reagent that we use is going to be a biuret reagent to test for the presence of protein. So there's going to be protein inside this bag, just water here. We're going to let this bag sit in here and see if protein can diffuse out. You're going to take a sample of this water, put it in the test tube, add biuret reagent to it, and see if it is positive or not. This should actually come out to be negative because um, protein is too large to diffuse out of those bags. So this is what the test result looks like if it's negative. Biuret is a blue um, reagent, so it's, this is just a blue color um, diffusing into the water, but a positive test would be purple. So this is positive, this is negative. And remember, for this, for the dialysis tube, the results should come out to be negative. And I believe that is it for um, 
diffusion, selective permeability, and osmosis, please do keep the concepts in mind for your exam.